27-year-old was executed, shot twice in the back. Two gunmen fired at least a dozen shots at him, three of them hitting him in the jaw, shoulder and neck. It was highly dangerous. This was a crazy time in Sydney. There were rival gangs shooting each other up everywhere. You just did not go out at night. Uh, the locals didn't go out at night. Anyone who was there after hours was either an undercover cop, a drug dealer, or a junkie looking for a hit. It was once the heroin capital of Australia, a neighbourhood renowned for Asian gangs, shootings and a notoriously high crime rate. Come nightfall, the streets would be deserted by drug addicts, dealers and disaffected youth. With most of the country too terrified to visit the suburb of Cabramatta in Sydney southwest, News Corp journalist Charles Miranda was assigned to go undercover. He set up shop in a rented flat for three months and was told to report on the things he saw and heard in the neighbourhood derailed by drugs. Charles, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Tell me, what were those three months like? Fascinating. Uh, a real eye-opener. I mean, it was almost like a social experiment where they said, get out of your comfort zone, get out of Bondi, where I was living at that time, and just go live there, literally with a shirt on my back. I could take nothing and they said everything that you want or need you have to buy from there so i would literally buy cutlery pots pans plates an old tv set just to fit out this flat and and live there for that time and so you're living in this little flat this neighborhood at the time has this kind of fearsome reputation that's known for shootings what did you see and hear there? You know, what were some of the most dangerous episodes you encountered? This was uh, a crazy time in Sydney. There were rival gangs shooting each other up everywhere. I think in that period prior to us going there, and it was almost 20 years ago now, but there were 40 shootings, there were several murders, several deaths, all related to or linked to the drug trade. It was highly dangerous and you just did not go out at night. Uh, the locals didn't go out at night. There were very few locals that actually lived in the area that who may have worked in that area. Anyone who was there after hours was either an undercover cop, a drug dealer or a junkie looking for a hit. That's the only reason you'd go to the suburb after hours. Of course, now it's very different. One man was hit in the head and pelvis, the other in both legs. A man loses his fight for life, stabbed on a busy Cabramatta street. His assassin then fired two bullets to his head. How did the locals relate to you? You were obviously an out-of-towner. I stood out for um, probably at least the, the first month. And then they'd recognise your face and they realise, well, he's pretty harmless and we know he lives in that uh, that building there, which is fairly much uh, a, a brothel. There were, there were you know, brothel rooms all in the same uh, apartment block that I was in. The ladies would get to know you. The customers would get to know you. You were pretty harmless at that stage and they'd stop trying to sell their wares, their drugs, whatever they were trying to sell their bodies, they wouldn't do that anymore. They'd recognise you as for who you were, just a local. People offered to sell you drugs? All the time, all the time, they'd come up to you. But just as an observer, I mean, it was a fascinating, fascinating time and a fascinating place to, uh, to be. So it was completely open there. You would literally just walk down the street and people would come up to you and, and offer you heroin. You didn't have to kind of scurry into a back alleyway with someone or give someone a certain look or... A... No, it was very much almost, I dare say, almost accepted and, uh, and people just turned a blind eye. The shopkeepers, very traditional, just went about their business and, uh, and ignored the guy with the little pouch who was, uh, who was selling drugs. You also knew various spots, various corners where these deals would go down. There'd be a particular phone box where a phone call would be made and the cars would roll in. They would literally not even have to stop Someone would be hanging in the window, a baggie would be passed out and it would drive on. The money would be recouped later or was some sort of an account because anyone who used that payphone would know that was the, the delivery. I mean, I sat there once watching it and it was bumper to bumper. The cars were having to stop because there were so many customers coming in for their drugs. It was a situation which I think gave Cabramatta its very bad reputation as the heroin capital of Australia. There wasn't much heroin coming in to the country that wouldn't have passed through Sydney, Sydney's ports, but certainly not Sydney's control of that trade at that time. 
What about the train? That had a certain nickname during that time, didn't it? The Smack Express, and uh, I caught that several times. It was just the, a, a normal commuter train, but very few people commuted that way at that time. And in fact, most people who were on that train would get off at Cabramatta and buy their drugs. They were travelling out there just to get the drugs. And then they would run across the tracks to the other side, get on the train and go back into the city. I mean, it was literally that sort of business. And I think the council at the time tried to pioneer all sorts of things, which were very new in those days. They're almost common, a bit more common now, but they were playing classical music and uh, country and Western style songs on repeat over and over to try and discourage people from hanging around in that area. But most people weren't anyway. They were coming, getting their drugs and, uh, and going back. Did you see many overdoses? I did see some overdoses, yes. And the Narcan man, the, the Ambos would, uh, would turn up, probably not that quickly, but uh, they would eventually turn up and try and revive these guys. It got to the stage where shopkeepers were looking at taking legal action against the police. Such was the crime rate in the suburb at the time. They'd literally had a gut full and said, this is our only avenue to get more resources, more law enforcement, police resources, whatever, into this area, that would be to, uh, to sue them. And they went ahead and did that. Now, you know, the argument was having a random patrol go through during the day was not enough. Putting up the sort of the blue fluoro lights so the junkies couldn't find their veins when they were shooting up, that's not good enough. You need dedicated resources at all hours. And when we went in undercover, it was around about the time that police had all sorts of specialist flying squads, for want of a better term. And we joined one for, uh, for one particular operation and things started to turn around. But one of the things that really stood out about Cabramet at the time was many locals would have spanners in their back pockets. And you think, oh, okay, that's a bit odd. Are they all, are they all mechanics or, uh, or fitters or something like that? No, it's because they all took the tap heads off their taps in their front yards to stop junkies coming and shooting up in their front yards and throwing their syringes on the lawns. So they'd take their tap heads off and on weekends or whatever, they'd have the spanner so they could turn the tap on, they could wash their cars, hose their flowers and their, their plants, and then again, turn it off back pocket, no tap heads on the uh, on the taps. And that was extraordinary. And one of the other things that I heard and I thought, mm, maybe an urban myth is, it, could it possibly be true? But some of the junkies actually felt the situation was so out of control and the needles was, were so out of control, they'd start to throw them onto rooftops to think, well, let's get them out of harm's way from, from kids picking them up. Of course, big downpours, the rains would come out and they'd be washed straight back out on the street. So it, it didn't work. So when you were walking around there, you had to be constantly kind of cautious of stepping on needles and being aware that you, there were needles around. Was it that bad? It was that bad, to be frank. Uh, you really had to watch where you were walking, more so in the parks and on things, but you might want to sit on a wall in the shops and there'd be a syringe right there. They're all over the mall, the very nice, beautiful pedestrian mall, and there'd be syringes all around there. And these are the sort of things that the shopkeepers would complain about. At that time also, at night, it would be extraordinary. There'd be roller shutters and steel grills and everything would shut. There'd be a couple of glows of a couple of takeaway joints, but pretty much the whole suburb uh, shut. And you contrast that to during the day, it was bustling. You could have been in Hainan or Hanoi, you know, there were people on the streets selling their wares and big blue tubs of fish and they were holding it up and trying to sell you a steak. And, you know, there was that sort of dynamic, multicultural, real sense and the flavors and the smells around the place. I mean, it was a fabulous place by day, but by night it, it changed. But, you know, during the day as well, those syringes and that reputation really grated on, on business keepers who had had enough. Cabramatta's notorious drug dealers are about to be crash tackled. Extra police will hit the streets, targeting heroin distribution and drug abuse in an operation codenamed Puccini. You mentioned you got to accompany the police on a special mission. Tell us a bit more about that. Look, I'd be unfair to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. They were Australia's ugliest men and women in the in the force. <laughs> and I, that's a slightly unfair, but look, these guys were hand selected and to put it diplomatically, because they had a certain look, which would carry them as being true undercover. They look like junkies. And so they were hand selected from uh, all over uh, New South Wales and all over the Sydney commands, specifically to go into that Greater Hume command to act as undercover operatives and, and really find out at a street level what's going on. So, you know, I would be in the briefing room and you would see them there and they all look scruffy and they all had certain looks and hairs. And by night I would see them sort of half lying on the pavement there, just watching things go by and, and people would just ignore them because, yeah, they're a junkie sleeping it off or whatever. 
So it was very effective. It was a very effective operations at the time. Did you ever accompany them on any raids or anything like that? In my little flat, I had a huge map of Cabramatta blown up from various bits of paper. So it was all up there. And I had a police scanner. And so every night I got to start to put red dots on where there were operations. And I could get there fairly quickly. You'd hear the call come across the police scanner. In those days, they weren't digitised, so you could actually track it fairly well. I'd be on the spot before the police would turn up and you could see what was going on, then the police would turn up. That map, by the end of my stint in that suburb, was so red, I actually stopped after a while because there were so many dots, it just made it a ridiculous plan. Um, and then I would actually go in with the police into, into various drug dens, I think, in one night. We did three or four different drug dens because the intelligence had built up to such a stage, right, let's go in, let's see what we can find. And, and it wasn't just heroin either, there was cocaine, but it, cocaine was not as prevalent uh, as heroin was in those days and certainly not in this area, which was the undisputed heroin capital of Australia. Was there ever a time during those three months in Cabramatta where you felt genuinely scared for your life? Not really. <sighs> Look... There were murders and there was bashings and there was standover and there was a lot of violent crimes at that time, but they were being done by rival gangs. So it was gang on gang or gang on junkie and nobody really wanted to draw attention by attacking a random Caucasian guy on the street. So, you know, once they approach you and try and sell you drugs and realise you weren't there to buy, they didn't bother you anymore. So. I didn't feel that. Now, of course, I, I was probably more fearful of, of the junkies who were jumping out at street corners, wanted more, thought you were someone else or whatever else and were coming at you and you sort of had to get your skates on and just, uh, just avoid them. So Charles, you know, that was all 20 years ago. You've been back to Cabramatta recently. What's it like now? There's been a great evolution since those days. And it's, it's almost the 20th anniversary since we had all the troubles in that area. And it is still the same vibrant, dynamic, diverse, multinational, cultural centre that it always has been during the day 20 years ago, but it's now like that at night. And you can walk the streets at night without fear or favour. Uh, and it's, it's got that same vibrancy about it. It's a fantastic place. The drugs are gone. Drugs are gone. They're, they're always going to be there in some form, but they're largely gone. And, and certainly multiple police operations on that area has cleaned up the streets.